Hello, Ohio politics party people. Welcome to Ohio Has Issues. I'm Mike Polk Jr. I'm Stephanie Haney with much less peas to start this party today. We have a great show for you tonight, but we're going to be focusing on one thing in particular, and that's something you might be wondering about if you are a voter here in Ohio, and that is, will I have the opportunity, if I wanted to, to vote for the current sitting president? It's a big question. Right now, you do not. <laughs> you do not. You could not if you wanted to right yeah. now. But the, the, that might be on the mend. Uh, but right now, Joe Biden is not on the Ohio ballot. So we've really focused in on that today. We're going to talk about it a little bit. But first, we've got a lot more to get to. Yeah, we do. We've got a roundup of kind of what's going on in the state of Ohio. So first, we want to stick with something we've been talking about from week to week because it just continues to have updates. A lot of tentacles, this first energy thing. It sure, it does. It does have a lot of tentacles. And metaphorically. <laughs> metaphorically. Mm -hmm. Not officially, not that we know of. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised it, if there was week, an octopus involved. Next week, we might find out it really has physical tentacles. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't yeah, shock me at all. It wouldn't be shocked either. That's where we're at. I'm never surprised when I'm surprised. Mm -mm. So uh, we know former Ohio House Speaker Larry Householder. He's in federal prison right now, serving a 20-year sentence. He's going to be facing state charges here in Ohio very soon, within the next month. And we're learning more details about this first energy bribery scandal, kind of about some money that has been associated with first energy, where it's gone. Three News investigative reporter Alina Lai has more for us on that. Let's check it out. Newly released documents from a lawsuit by First Energy investors is shedding more light on the flow of money from First Energy to Ohio's politically powerful. Speaker Householder, what do you have to say to Ohioans? Former Ohio House Speaker Larry Householder, already sentenced to 20 years on federal bribery charges, is set to answer to state charges for accepting $60 million in First Energy bribes for the passage of the billion-dollar nuclear plant bailout known as House Bill 6. Householder's state case will be heard in Cuyahoga County because the alleged financial transactions happened in Cleveland. At the center of the bribery scheme is the dark money group Partners for Progress, which First Energy admits was created and funded to conceal the bribes. IRS filings showed the dark money group operated under the same address as Cleveland law firm Kalfi Holder in Griswold here on East 6th Street in downtown Cleveland. According to internal First Energy documents, Partners for Progress was run by a current Kalfi partner, Michael Van Buren. And more internal emails show First Energy paid $1 million to Freedom Frontier in 2017, calling it Houston Campaign. FEC filings show that group then donated more than a million dollars to Ohio conservatives for a change, a group backing Lieutenant Governor John Houston. Tonight, a spokesperson for Houston said the Houston Campaign never received this donation and is not affiliated with any of these groups. These are the kinds of private records of things you really don't get often as a reporter. And in partnership with 3 News, Cleveland.com reporter Jake Zuckerman shares more First Energy documents showing millions more going to another dark money group for the benefit of Governor Mike DeWine. They made a series of contributions that totaled to about $2.5 million to an organization called State Solutions, which was supporting the governor and actually one of those payments there was an internal not notation that's explicitly referred to it as for, quote, DeWine. And you can read more about that as well as DeWine's response on Cleveland.com. Now, we should note that Houston and DeWine have not been accused of wrongdoing. While Householder's next court date is in three weeks, trial is pending for two First Energy executives also indicted under state corruption charges in Summit County. Let's give them the bullet points. Essentially, what happened here was that uh, we found out some new information uh, about what happened even prior to the HB6 scandal. We do, and there's actually an article from Jake Zuckerman from Cleveland.com. I think we have that for you, so we can pull up that article here momentarily, and we'll kind of give you the bullet points because his reporting was yes. really kind of instrumental to this story. We're so thoroughly just completely ravaging uh, his reporting, and he did great work. And he reports for Cleveland.com. And what we can tell you is that First Energy Corporation made $2.5 million in secret payments to a dark money nonprofit, basically quoting from Jake Zuckerman's article here. 
This was to a group that backed Republican Mike DeWine's 2018 governor run. Now this was as the company was pulling off what ended up becoming referred to as the biggest public corruption scheme in state history. David DeVillers, the prosecuting attorney in the case, referred to it as such. So, so far, you know, we'll see where we, you know, gotta, yeah. have, gotta have goals. We, we yes. shouldn't undersell anybody's ability to be corrupt here in the state of Ohio. You never know what could happen, but yes, to date. So there's some new documents that have been released that show that the Akron-based power company paid $2.5 million to State Solutions. This was a 501c4 nonprofit, so that's a dark money organization. This is an organization that's not required in order to, you know, disclose where its money's going, where it's coming from, that kind of thing. And importantly, they also cannot engage with the campaigns themselves. So at least, uh, allegedly, they have to be completely disconnected from each other. Yeah, but what we can tell you is that two contributions listed in First Energy's internal giving list, as seen in these documents, were listed as RGA, which would line up with Republican Governors Association. State Solutions is funded in part and associated with the Republican Governors Association. A third contribution of $500,000 is listed as DeWine. So I would not, really recommend you check a, out that Not reporting. a lot of ambiguity on that one, yeah. obviously. So, Check out that reporting from Jake Zuckerman. It's on cleveland.com. Of course, we'll link it in the show notes so that you can check that out. Very good stuff. Interesting stuff from Jake. Nice job there. And that became public because of a public request record, a public records request. Otherwise, we might not have known about that. First Energy has settled a lawsuit. So this was documents that were involved in the settlement of that lawsuit. So there you go. All right, let's move on to our next topic. Uh, yesterday, or not yesterday, but last week, we talked with you about Ohio House Bill 68. This is the transgender care ban. What Ohio House Bill 68 will do, if and when it becomes effective, is it will ban transgender women and girls from competing in women and girls sports, and it will also ban gender-affirming care for transgender youth. So we told you a Franklin County judge blocked it temporarily, put a 14-day block on it or a block until a hearing will happen, whichever comes first. It was supposed to be effective today, April 24th. So we can tell you today that that order from Franklin County Common Pleas Judge Michael Holbrook, it's been challenged by Attorney General Dave Yost. Yes, David Yost has put the smack down and said, hold on, that might have been a bit of an overreach on your part. And he says that he was uh, out of his depth calling it an overbroad order. So, of course, this is his challenge that's been filed. That's his interpretation, and that'll have to be adjudicated, of course. But he is filing a challenge to that. So what Attorney General Dave Yost is saying is that the injunction is unlawful because it implies to the entire state and not just the two plaintiffs who challenged the law in a lawsuit that was filed in March. And what we can tell you is that judicial rules for common pleas courts here in the state of Ohio, they state preliminary injunctions like this one, which is a temporary pause mm -hmm. on this, they can be only broad enough to protect the plaintiffs in a case. So that's the basis on which he filed this challenge. Saying that this would only apply to the two people. Okay. Yep. All right. And you, is that, does that seem, will that, do you think, hold up? Well, we'll have to see what happens. I mean, it is a common pleas court policy. It is a common police court rule here in the state of Ohio. We'll have to see how that's interpreted when okay. it becomes adjudicated. Well, I feel like we got to update people because we got this big Senate race. We do. We got to update people on the Senate race. November, we could decide the tip. Uh, we could decide which way the Senate tips in November, Ohio. Uh, you remember that. That's up to you. And so we're going to be following, uh, obviously, Sherrod Brown and Bernie Moreno, who are competing for that spot. And what's going on this week with those cats? Well, first of all, we can tell you that Bernie Moreno has a new campaign manager. So wow. here's the details on that. David DiStefano, he was Marino's campaign manager for the primary election. Now his new campaign manager is Brian Gray, who previously was Senator J.D. Vance's state director. I see. That was when J.D. Vance was running. It's a small previously. state, folks. Yeah. So we did get a quote from Marino's campaign about this. So uh, we'll read that for you now. David was essential to our victory, and that's why we are elevating him to a senior advisor role and will continue to be highly involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the campaign. Brian was a critical member of Senator Vance's team last cycle. And we are thrilled to have him join our team in the general election to defeat Sherrod Brown in November 
we need a robust team. That's his Bernie Moreno campaign. Okay, so some there. things kind of just shifting around there. No one leaving the team, but some roles changing. Interesting to know about. What else do we have going now, on Now, here? here's some big news. You may or may not have heard that a national security package mm. passed. That passed at the national level, so we want to give you the bullet points on that. So, uh, Mike, tell us, what, what, what are the nuts and bolts of okay. this national Obviously, security package? Obviously, we're going to relate this back to Ohio and what your Ohio representatives and, and politicians have uh, had to do with this. This was a huge deal. Obviously, this was in the works for a very long time. It was very controversial. Uh, a lot of political maneuvering and whatnot. It took a very long time to pass, but it did pass. It's, it, and it involved $60, $60 billion for Ukraine in its war against Russia, $8.12 billion for the Indo-Pacific, that includes Taiwan, and a sanction that includes language forcing TikTok's Chinese-based owner to sell social media, sell their social media app within a year. That also includes the Israel aid, um, and also um, a la language that uh, authorizes the White House to seize frozen Russian assets, which mm. I think is kind of exciting, personally. <laughs> and they will use that money towards aiding Ukraine's effort, which uh, is a real stick it, <clears throat> stick it to you there. Unsurprisingly, uh, as you might have guessed, Sherrod Brown's on board. Has been the whole time. Never any real arguments there. Um, not so much with our current Senator uh, J.D. Vance. He voted against the bill. He was one of 15 Republican senators who voted against uh, the bill a on Tuesday. And that there were also two Democratic senators, I believe. Let me find this too. So it wasn't. It was a. It was a bipartisan um, peeing match. <laughs> two Democrats and one Independent also voted against the measure. That was Jeff Merkley of uh, Oregon, Peter Welch of Vermont, both Democrats, and of course Bernie Sanders, the Independent from Vermont as well. The Vermont boys held out, uh, and then three senators, uh, all Republicans, didn't vote at all. That was Rand Paul, Tim Scott, and Tommy Tuberville. But uh, yes. It's true. Uh, of course, J or J.D. Vance voted against the bill. He was one of the ones who voted against it. And Bernie Moreno had uh, this to say on the matter. Do you have this quote? We do. Here? We've got a quote from the Moreno campaign on oh, this. there it is. Bernie is supportive of crucial aid to our longstanding ally Israel, but would have opposed the larger package that passed the Senate. Now, we do want to mention something that was part of that larger package as well, particularly relevant here in Ohio. There was an act in there that was authored by Senator Sherrod Brown. This is the Fend Off Fentanyl Act, which was part of this measure, and that did get passed. And this is pertaining to sanctions and anti-money laundering law mm. and targets opioid traffickers. So we got a statement from Sherrod Brown on this. This is what he said publicly about this. Passage of the Fend Off Fentanyl Act is an important step that will save lives. We'll never stop fighting to protect Ohio communities from this deadly drug. And then a broader comment from Senator Brown on the security package in general. This is something that he tweeted. He said, last night, the Senate stood firm with the people of Ukraine fighting for their freedom. Putin's aggression must be stopped. He cannot be allowed to knock on NATO's door. That's why I'm proud to support Ukraine during this critical moment. And then he had a supportive hashtag on the end of that. This was a tweet from him. It is probably important to show the contrast between the two candidates because this is one place where they really differ. Um, Reno has said throughout the Senate campaign, this is again going um, this back to our friend Andrew Tobias's reporting, who we steal a lot of stuff from as well, the plane <laughs> dealer. Moreno has said throughout the Senate campaign that he supports ending U.S. military support for Ukraine. He initially said the U.S. doesn't need to fund Israel following the attack there uh, by Hamas in October, although he quickly revised his position to say uh, that helping fund the U Israeli military is important. When asked last month whether he supports banning TikTok, which was a part of this as well, mm -hmm. uh, Moreno said he'd need to study the issue further, but had concerns about, quote, weaponizing government, end quote, against individual companies. And while Moreno hasn't specifically commented on the Fentanyl Act, he called a previous border security bill that contained, quote, 300, uh, contained it, quote, 357 pages of garbage. That's referring to uh, the immigration bill that got thwarted at the finish line. Right, yeah, and that would have been a part of that yes. had it moved through in that. Okay, before we get into our main topic of the day, let's take a quick break, and we'll be back with you here in just a moment when we get into the drama. The goods, the goods, folks, hang in. The drama, drama, drama.
Okay, look at our beautiful newsroom. <laughs> We're back. Um, let me ask you this, everybody. Um, if you thought right now that you didn't have the opportunity to vote for the sitting president, if you live, if you are an Ohioan, um, would that like trouble you in any way? For some of you, you'd probably be like, "That's absolutely fine by me." Uh, for some of you, though, you might be like, "You know, I'd like the opportunity to vote for the sitting president who's running again." But right now, you couldn't because of a weird thing we've got going on in Ohio that is keeping President Biden off the ballot for Democrats. Yeah, it's a it's a real thing. We're going to kind of get into that. But first, we're going to give you the comments from our current senator, Sherrod Brown, and also the challenger, Bernie Marino, the Senate candidate. So here's what they have to say about this issue, about the ability for people to vote on this. Quote, I think voters in Ohio should have a choice for the major party candidates. Never was, uh, never was a problem when I was Secretary of State. It will get fixed. It's US gotta Senator, get fixed. It yep. will get fixed. Thank you. U.S. Senator Sherry Brown. And then what did Bernie Moreno say? He said, just like the unfair treatment that President Trump has received in blue states in an attempt to keep him out of the White House, Bernie opposes the efforts to keep Joe Biden off the ballot. See that? So he is pro Joe Biden being on the ballot. Does that surprise you at all? No, I'm not surprised by that. I mean, what are you going to say? People shouldn't get to vote for him. That's, yeah, it's I'm not surprised. Much that was a good move on his part. Not surprised by that at all. Oh, yeah. So that's our main topic of the day. Will Biden be on the ballot in Ohio? So this is all about Ohio's requirement to certify candidates for the ballot. It's, a, it's required in Ohio to be done 90 days before the election. I want to give you a little context on mm -hmm. where we stand in terms of other states here. Okay, so Ohio is one of the earliest deadlines for presidential candidates in the country. This is according to the National Association of Secretaries of State. They've got a chart on this on their website. That's a bipartisan trade association of representing state election officials. I bet that's a heck of a Christmas party with, <laughs> with, the, you, with that group. You know it is. Mm -hmm. You know it is. Uh, so most state deadlines actually fall in September, some are in October, and some states like Illinois, Michigan, and Texas, they set their deadlines relative to the party convention dates, not the election itself. Now, from what I understand, we are not the only state this year even. that We've done this in the past, by the way, uh, Democrats and Republicans here in Ohio since we have enacted this law. We've but, had situations where they had to make accommodations. Yes, yes, where it was uh, more of a bipartisan thing. <clears throat> but this time, it's just the Democrats. But we're not the only ones, just so you know, here in Ohio who uh, messed this up. There are a couple other states, right? Right, this year. There are other states. There's issues in Alabama, mm -hmm. also in Washington. Now, Oklahoma, like Ohio, they've got the same deadline 90 days before the election, but they've got a law for submitting provisional certification, which is something we're gonna talk about more today. And uh, here's a little bit more on that. As we look ahead to the November presidential election, we've been getting this question from viewers. Will President Joe Biden be on the Ohio ballot? While looking into this, we checked the Ohio Revised Code and talked to the Ohio Attorney General's office, the Ohio Secretary of State's office, and President Joe Biden's campaign. Staff from Ohio Secretary of State Frank LaRose's office let the Ohio Democratic Party know on April 5th that Ohio's deadline to certify a presidential candidate for the ballot is August 7th. But Biden won't become the official Democratic nominee until the Democratic National Convention, the DNC, takes place from August 19th to 22nd. The DNC ends 75 days before the November 5th election. And Ohio law requires a presidential candidate to be certified 90 days before the election. When we asked Biden's campaign what they plan to do about this, they told us, quote, Joe Biden will be on the ballot in all 50 states. State officials have the ability to grant provisional ballot access certification prior to the conclusion of presidential nominating conventions. In 2020 alone, states like Alabama, Illinois, Montana, and Washington all allowed provisional certification for Democratic and Republican nominees. But a staff attorney from Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost's office says that's not an option in Ohio, as outlined in an advisory letter sent to the Secretary of State's office, which also says LaRose's office can't waive the 90-day deadline. This was actually a problem for both the Republican and Democratic parties in 2020, but the Ohio legislator passed a bill then to fix the issue. Ben Kindle from LaRose's office told us, this law has been on the books for many years. It was changed to a 90-day deadline in 2009, and the General Assembly voted in 2019 to temporarily make an exception for both major parties ahead of the 2020 election, so this isn't a new issue. 
Our office also noted the change in a 2019 advisory and specifically clarified that future presidential elections would revert back to the 90-day requirement. We've reached out to Ohio's House and Senate leaders from both the Republican and Democratic parties to see what they plan to do this time, and they haven't answered us yet. So that's why today we can't verify just yet whether President Biden will be on the ballot in Ohio. We can tell you that this has also come up this year in Alabama, where their legislature is working on a bill to overcome this issue, and in Washington, where that state will be allowing provisional certification. All right, so that's a rundown for you of where we stand, the reason that we're here, what's happening currently in Ohio. So Ohio Senate President Matt Huffman has said multiple things about this, and it's changed a little bit over time. So one of the first quotes that we have from him on this topic is, it's a Democratic problem. There should have to be a Democratic solution. That was not that long ago, as I recall, but he has since, um, seems to be, softened a bit on his position. Because just uh, just last week he said, <clears throat> this has got to be resolved for folks who said, well, we Republicans kicked Joe Biden off the ballot. I think that's wrong. I think we're not going to be able to look at the current president of the United States and a major political candidate and just say, we got a law. You didn't know about it. Ha ha. Okay, so got to do a little fishing. Quote, certainly it's something that's going to happen. We need to take that care of it. That was today. That's today, right there. So apparently... He, uh, that's quite a shift. Uh, so what does that tell you, the fact that um, he made that move that far or quickly? Well, you know, there's a lot of people talking about this. Yes. People from all levels of government are talking about it. Mm -hmm. Also, Senator J.D. Vance spoke about this. So we have a quote from him. He mm. said this publicly to another outlet. He said, I would encourage all of my fellow citizens in the state of Ohio to not vote for Joe Biden. And again, I don't think that they will. I think Trump will probably win, maybe by double digits. But the people of Ohio get to make that choice, not weird ballot quirks. A heroic uh, testimony to <laughs> democracy right there, isn't it? Very nice. Well, he certainly is entitled to his opinion on what he thinks the people of Ohio will do he if is. given the opportunity. But he did agree. Well, it seems like there is a consensus now that Joe Biden, the Democratic, the person who uh, was selected by Democratic primary voters in Ohio by like 80 percent, should be allowed to be on the ballot. Yeah. That's nice to see. Yeah. That's good. But something's got to happen mm -hmm. in order for that to happen. Yes. So you talked today with a friend of ours, friend of the show. Now, this guy has been in the weeds and figuring out what's been going on for a, a very long time. He, he has the resources. He has the intel. It's he is Jeremy Pelzer, and we are going to hear from him right after a little break. Thank you. Welcome back to Ohio Has Issues, everybody. I'm Mike Bolt, Jr. Enjoying a little popcorn snack. I'm Stephanie Haney. We deserve it. Um, and I mean, you need popcorn for what's going on here in Ohio. I, I feel do. Like. It's crazy out there right now. <laughs> and, and we have some of the best people that we bring you every week to help us unravel it from some of the best papers in the state, including my friend Jeremy Pelzer, who's going to get into the weeds a little bit about what exactly moves are being made to make sure or to prevent, I guess, depending on your viewpoint, um, Joe Biden, our current president, from being on the Ohio ballot. He knows what's going on. Take a listen. Oh, Lord, look who we've got with us again. It's Mr. Jeremy Pelzer. Thank you so much, Jeremy. He is a political reporter in the Columbus area who works for Cleveland.com in the Plain Dealer. But you're stationed down there in Columbus. So you don't get to be up here in Cleveland with us. But we're still happy to have you. Well, it's great to be here, even uh, if I am in Columbus. I know. It's a, it's a, it's an absolute economic powerhouse and just such a cultural wasteland, but you didn't hear that here. I'm just kidding. It's a blast. <laughs> Try the zoo. Uh, so we have you here for one very specific reason. It's because you cover politics in this crazy state of ours. And uh, we kind of want we're trying to figure out today why the sitting president who won the um, primary decisively is currently not on the Ohio ballot. 
Uh, we're kind of unraveling that. But why we have you here is we want you to describe what the politicians are saying about it right now. The people in charge who are actually going to be making the fixes that are going to be necessary if they do happen to get them on the ballot because you are in the trenches with them. So if you wouldn't mind just going through sort of the, the people uh, who are going to be making this decision and, what, and how people are reacting and what they're saying. Sure. Uh, so as to the, your first question about why this is happening, uh, when you find out, let me know. It's, uh, someone clearly dropped the ball here. Uh, it was probably the Democrats. Uh, I, in fact, it was obviously the Democrats had some because this has happened in the past. This happened in 2012. This happened in 2020 to both candidates in Ohio, uh, both the Republican and Democratic nominees. So this is nothing new. And so the question is now what what do you do? And so the actually ABC News kind of laid out the Democrats thinking on this. Uh, so first of all, the Ohio Democrats are kind of leaving this to the national Democrats to sort out. So Democratic lawmakers here, uh, the state party, they're saying, OK, well, let, we'll get our marching orders from uh, D.C. and the Democratic National Committee about what to do. The DNC has four, like a, a pecking order of four things in order of uh, what they want to see. The first, uh, they didn't it didn't work. They tried to tell uh, Frank LaRose's office, the Secretary of State, hey, we are, we're going to uh, provisionally certify Joe Biden as the nominee until the Democratic National Convention. And Dave Yost, the Attorney General, said, well, you can't do that. That did and not get past the Yost goalie. And yeah, uh, Yost said, no, no dice. And so that's not going to happen. So now step two, uh, at least according to ABC News, is to try to get legislation passed. But of course, the main problem uh, in Ohio for Democrats is that they control only about a third of each house of the state legislature, so they need Republicans to do it. Uh, there's been some questions asked about, well, one, if Republicans would allow this to happen, it seems they're now becoming a little more amenable to that. Uh, but then there's the question of, well, would they, the Republicans add some sort of poison pill? Like, oh, well, if the Democrats need this so bad, why don't we uh, roll back abortion rights or something that would be really politically unpalatable? I'm not saying I'm not hearing specifically abortion, but just in general, some sort of thing like if, well, right. if we have you over a barrel, we can get something for a this. Trade -off. A trade off. <laughs> a trade off. A trade off with a gun uh, pointed at you. Mm -hmm. uh, so it remains to be seen. If there's been no legislation introduced. There have been talks, especially in the House, about doing this, but uh, both. Um, House Speaker Jason Stevens, who's a Republican, indicated that he's pretty open to this because he said, you know, this might happen to a Republican in the future if the Republican National Convention is after the state deadline. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said any fix they want to happen, they just, because up until now, they've been passing kind of one-time fixes for this sort of thing, and they want to make it a permanent fix so this doesn't happen. Uh, so that remains to be seen. Then after that, if that doesn't work, then they would hold a mini convention. They would have like basically a Zoom meeting where they would have, for the purposes of Ohio state law, the convention, the Democratic National Convention, and they would certify Joe Biden as the Democratic presidential nominee. Uh, and, you know, then that would theoretically meet what Ohio law requires, at least according to Frank LaRose. Hmm. So it's just kind of a giant cluster. And right now everyone's sort of waiting to see what the DNC is going to come up with. Uh, as I talked to David Niven, who's a political science professor at the University of Cincinnati, and he said, basically, some lawyer at the DNC is going to get fired over this because it's just uh, an absolute self-own on this. Now, it was, as you said, though, this did happen recently with both parties, very recently. So did they have a reason for why it happened that time? I know it's a relatively new law, but it's happened multiple times already, has it not? Yeah, so the reason that, so in this year, the deadline is August 7th. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's 90 days before the election and the reason as well, uh, they need uh, ballot elections. Officials need time to prepare for the election, especially because, you know, you have uh, ahead of time. You have to send out ballots super early to like military and overseas voters. And you just count back and it gets you know, to 90 days to prepare for this election. So that's why they passed this law. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're the Republican or Na Democratic National Committees, you're not really paying attention to Ohio and when you're scheduling a, a convention. You're, there's a lot of other factors, national factors that play into that. And I should say too, um, Ohio's not the only state that has this problem. Right now, Washington state and Alabama have also, their secretaries of state have said, Biden might, Biden not, might, might not make the ballot there as well. Uh, it seems that conditional or provisional certification argument is gonna work in Washington state. 
Meanwhile, Alabama, their legislature is actually moving on legislation to create an exemption for Biden. I believe that just passed the Alabama State Senate. So do you really think this was just complete oversight by the Democrats or there, I'm, I don't mean to give anybody credit where credit is due, to, but this, there's nothing strategic about this in any way, or it wasn't uh, something that even they knew about, but they were sort of, because, because it, it had been fixed in the past when there was something wrong, they just assumed that it would get fixed. They'd just come up with a fix again. So they were like, well, we'll figure it out later. How could this have happened? It's an open question. Uh, I mean, I'm here in Columbus. I don't have strong sources in the DNC in Washington, D.C. I do know probably that. Probably none quick to raise their hand and say, you know what? That was my bad. Hey, guys. Yeah, my bad. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'd take a mulligan on this one. Uh, it's. I know that at least one Ohio Democrat raised concerns about this months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, so, and also, again, this has happened before. So at the very least, it should have been on their radar. They have lawyers whose only job it is to monitor states to make sure that all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed on these kind of obscure state laws like this. And clearly someone dropped the ball. Um, and I can't imagine they're going to you know, push out uh, the lawyer front and center to just make him the scapegoat or her the scapegoat. You did mention in your reporting, sis, that Republicans are seem to be softening on this at least. It, they seemed a bit more contentious a few weeks ago, uh, almost challenging the Democrats and saying it's their problem and almost sounding as if they really intended to not help in any way and keep them off the ballot and if possible. Why do you think there's been at least some kind of a, a shift? Do you think what do you think the reasoning is behind that? Well, um, that that initial statements you talked about, they came from Senate President Matt Huffman. So Jason Stevens over in the House, he's like, OK, you know, we can work with you guys. Mm -hmm. Matt Huffman in the Senate initially said, well, this is the Democrats problem. They got themselves into this mess. They can get themselves out of this mess. Uh, but last week he got he softened his language. He basically said, hey, look, you know, Biden's going to be on the ballot. Don't worry about that. Well, it's just a question of how it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, he thought that if nothing else, the federal courts would order Biden to be on the ballot. Uh, actually, because of the Colorado Trump ruling that the Supreme Court did uh, recently, where they said states can't pass laws regulating federal elections and keeping federal candidates off the ballot. And so Matt Huffman says, if nothing else, because the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Trump, they'll rule in favor of Biden now as well. As far as why he's uh, softening his language, you know, um, uh, maybe it's just he took more time to study the issue. Maybe he talked it over with people, uh, you know, either Republicans or Democrats, but it, it's definitely a more uh, conciliatory uh, statement than initially where he's like, hey, you guys deal with it. Right. Is it possible they just considered maybe it's not the best PR to be the people thwarting at least a large contention of Ohio voters, even if they're not the ones who are from your party from voting who they want to vote for and how they want to vote? Do you think that they thought about the repercussions of that? Perhaps. I think they did. I think they absolutely did. I, I know Matt Huffman last week absolutely said, hey, you know, we this isn't our fault, guys. Like, we're don't uh, the narrative like, oh, Republicans are keeping Joe Biden off the ballot like that. He's like, that's not what's happening here. We're going to work with you guys. So he's, the Matt Huffman is clearly sensitive to that argument. I mean, so Biden is going to probably lose Ohio anyway, even if he's on the ballot. But this has a lot, this really affects, the big thing here is the Senate race because, you know, Sherrod Brown's in one of the most hotly contested and most watched Senate races in the whole country against uh, Bernie Moreno. And if you don't have your marquee headliner on the ballot, a lot of Democrats are going to stay home. Ohio Democratic voters are going to stay home and that'll hurt Sherrod Brown. So the stakes here are not just about whether Biden will or won't win Ohio. That seems to be already kind of decided. But there's a lot of other down ballot races, most notably the Senate race at stake. Jerry Pelzer, thanks for your time. You wanted to mention your uh, your your letter. Yeah, uh, we have a newsletter. It's a daily free politics newsletter. Uh, it's called Capital Letter, uh, capital with an O. If you want to sign up, go to cleveland.com slash newsletters. Just look for Capital Letter and it'll be in your inbox every morning. I'm a subscriber and it's great stuff. It really is. And it gives you it gives everybody some really good insight, especially for nerds like us. So I appreciate you. All right. Um, Stay strong. Thanks, Nerd Power. Bye now. Thanks. Bye. Nerd Power indeed. <laughs> you know, I, it is nice. Are we just having this um, 
this like streaming show so that we can talk to people who are the only other like 18 people who care about the stuff that, that, that we do or are you guys really paying attention to us right now? I hope. I hope that you it's care. It's important to our hearts. I think they care. They're, it's not just us. It can't be just us. No. I know we need other people to talk to about it. But we're happy to have people like Jeremy. And honestly, he knows he knows his stuff. That was very helpful. Did you find that yeah, helpful? Yeah, I really did. You know, I did think it was an interesting part of the conversation when you were talking with him about, did somebody really not take notice of this? Or right. were they just thinking maybe it wasn't an issue before? It mm -hmm. probably won't be an issue again. And I'm thinking... Maybe maybe some more of that. I also wonder, I think we'll, we'll hear more about this in a bit with my conversation with Terry Casey, an election expert here in Ohio, about whether this would actually be beneficial for the Democrats or the Republicans or harmful for the Democrats or the Republicans. Right. Interesting take on that. But I don't know if anybody's getting fired over this. Hmm. This is not only the situation in Ohio, and it happened... The Biden campaign told me this because I reached out to them, talked to them this week, and their contention is he will be on the ballot in all 50 states, okay? But in 2020, Oklahoma, Illinois, Washington, and Montana accepted provisional certifications from the DNC. And all of those states, plus Alabama, accepted provisional certifications from the RNC. And let us also remind you again, in Ohio in 2020, they passed something in the Ohio Legislature to take care of this issue. Yes, they did. Now, we should bring up a quote from Attorney General Dave Yost, who you, you might be wondering how he feels on this subject. He said, quote, I fully expect the Democratic, the Democratic Party will find a way to fix their inexcusable, careless error and get their candidate on the ballot. After all, they have months left to work it out. But on my watch, they're going to do it while following the law. And that's the senior picture that we got there, which is very nice. It's very fortunate <laughs> that we were able to score that. It is interesting. You just mentioned, though, the fact that um, this happened to both parties here in Ohio in 2012 and 2020. And I am curious if uh, Dave Yost thinks, he said uh, that it was a, an inexcusable and careless error. Was it also an inexcusable and careless error in 2012 and 2020, or did, did it just become one when it became a monoparty situation? I don't know, and I don't know what's in the man's heart. But it was a careless error for both parties in, in both of those years. And apparently the Democrats did not learn their lesson. <laughs> apparently not. Apparently they weren't paying attention to whether it would be a problem both for them and for the Republican National Convention where these nominations happened. Yes. Now, as we mentioned, this is based on a law that passed in 2009 here in Ohio. So we wanted to get some background on this. Because I was wondering about this too. Why all of a sudden? This is, you know, some of our laws that are still trapping us are from like the 1700s and stuff like that. This is a very modern thing that we did to ourselves, and it seems like it's been nothing but trouble ever since. So I would be interested to know about the origin. Yeah, I mean, relatively so, you know, like within the last 15 years, yeah. right? It's 2024, 2009. So we talked with someone, we talked with a Republican strategist. His name is Terry Casey, and he has been in the election circles here for a long time here in Ohio. He was on the Franklin County Board of Elections for 14 years. Also, when Bob Taft was Secretary of State, he was the chair of the Board of Voting Machine Examiners. Mm. So if you're also wondering if this whole conversation about examining voting machines is a new one, it's not. He was chair of the board and part of that conversation. Been there, done that. Back when Bob Taft was the Secretary mm -hmm. of State here in Ohio. Also, he's still involved. If there's a recount required here in the state of Ohio now, he's involved in that process, likely going to be helpful in that We keep scenario. him behind glass and we break it in an emergency. <laughs> and you got to interview him. That's right. So uh, let's hear what Terry Casey had to say. All right. Now we say hello to Terry Casey, who is currently a Republican strategist, but has spent some time in the election world here in Ohio. So the person to talk to on this matter, Terry, thanks for being with us here on Ohio Has Issues. Glad to be here. Okay, so we kind of just want to first start with some background here, because this law that has come up, you know, some people have called it obscure, but it's not new. It's been around for a long time. So why is the deadline in Ohio? When did this happen 90 days before an election to get certified to get on a ballot? Well, the law is actually not that old, but it is a little bit recent. And part of it is because the federal government said we want to make sure overseas military people get their ballots in time. So Ohio, like other states, moved up their deadline. It used to be about 75 days for official filings for candidates and the paperwork. They moved it up in a lot of cases to 90 days. And the problem is the national people move deadlines back for conventions. 
And this has happened a couple times in the past. One of the years in 2019, they fixed it as a one-time fix. It didn't make it a permanent fix. So it looks like from comments from the state Senate president and other legislative leaders that they're going to work together and make it a permanent fix so that on presidential, the shorter 75-day deadline will apply rather than the current 90 days. And again, the 90 days was all because void to make sure the deadlines work out right so the ballots are ready, can get mailed out overseas to wherever military and other overseas people are at. Okay. So let me ask you this. There have been some comments, as you mentioned, Senate President Matt Huffman there. He first kind of made it seem like he was a little hesitant, like he was waiting to see what the Democratic Party was going to do. Then there was another comment from him saying, look, we have to get this fixed, but it was still kind of vague. So you sound pretty confident, though, there's going to be a legislative fix here. Why is that? Well, there always was a fix of either going to court and getting the judge to say, hey, you need to waive this deadline or adjust this deadline, or the National Democrats could do some things. They did that in 2012 of submitting some paperwork prior to the convention that kind of complied. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Nobody really challenged it. Uh, so this time we probably need more of a permanent fix. And obviously, as in politics, uh, if one side has an advantage over the other, they always like to play a little politics back and forth. But I think people in the legislature realize it needs to be fixed. And part of it is because the U.S. Senate race, they want to make sure that if Biden wasn't on the ballot, there might be a, not only Democrats that might not turn out, but there might be Republicans that don't turn out. So sometimes politics in the bigger picture trumps over, no pun intended, uh, over uh, other kind of political jabs that one side can poke at the other. Now, let me ask you about this. You mentioned in 2012 some paperwork that was submitted that might have been okay, might not have been okay. Some Another conversation that's happening right now is something called provisional certification. Now, here in Ohio, the attorney general has said no dice on that. That's not going to comply with Ohio law. Secretary of State Frank LaRose has said we uh, we are going with what the attorney general says here. Our role is to execute the laws here in Ohio, and the laws in Ohio do not allow for provisional certification. What's your opinion on that as someone who has experience in administrating elections? Because provisional certification is being allowed in the state of Washington where something similar is happening. Well, provisional certification is... Uh... Maybe okay if nobody challenges it, but obviously people are more aware of it and you're more likely to have a lawsuit. So I think everybody realizes you better fix it legally so there isn't any question or doubt because obviously there'd be a lot of finger pointing and it could benefit one side or the other. But rather than take a chance, I think the feeling right now is articulated by the state Senate president is let's go ahead and get it fixed and get it done. Yeah, I don't think anybody wants to see this results of this November election called into question. We do not need legal battles here in Ohio. That would certainly be an issue for Ohio, for sure. So is that your opinion? Do you agree with the Senate president that if this were to go to court and there were to be a challenge to President Biden potentially not being on the Ohio ballot, that the current president would win and end up on the Ohio ballot? Well, sometimes I'm accused of playing a lawyer on TV, but I'm not a real lawyer. And the specialty of election law is a very narrow one. There's only a few lawyers in Ohio that really know what they're doing in that category. So guessing what a court might do is all dependent upon who files, what questions they raise, what substance they have behind them. So I'm going to uh, pass on putting my finger in the wind and trying to guess. But again, a legislative solution is better because otherwise a lot of people would wonder, is there chicanery on one side or the other side? Now I'm going to ask you to guess on one more thing before I let you go here. Obviously a legislative solution would be final. We would have an answer. We would get some sense of, we would get a direct, a direct pointed piece of information on when the certification has to come in in order for Biden to get on the ballot. When do you think we're going to see something from the legislature? Do you have any idea on when that might come about? Well, predicting the Ohio legislature gets even more interesting these days because good news, bad news, we've got a House and a Senate, and they don't always agree on everything. And sometimes there's uh, little games and posturing that happens. But again, that's part of the legislative branch and the wisdom 
of having two branches, a House and a Senate and a governor and the courts. It's kind of a check and balance on things. So it sometimes gets hard to predict, but I think between May and June, the legislature needs to get a capital bill done. Uh, there's limited number of sessions, but again, they can, it seems like the tide has turned and there's a feeling of we really need to fix it. We just can't hope for one of the other alternatives. It's best to do it this way. Okay. All right, Terry, thank you very much for your insight on this. We appreciate it. Good. Thank you. So that was super insightful from Terry. I thought that was really interesting. Some good information. Input. Thank you, Terry. Appreciate it. Now, I want to talk about what's happening in Washington before we kind of wrap up things here, because in the state of Washington, I've looked at the letter of the law there. Now, I'm not a Washington lawyer. I'm not licensed there, but we did look at it. I did look at it. It's revised code 29A.56, if you're curious and you want to take a peek yourself. And I know you are. <laughs> and then I also talked to the Secretary of State from the state of Washington. Of course you did. I wanted to get a sense. You of, wanted to. I want to get a little comparison <laughs> of what's going on here. So here is what the Secretary of State's office told me. They said, in Washington, provisional certification was offered to both major parties in 2020. We mentioned that earlier. When each scheduled presidential nominations did not perfectly align with the deadline in state statutes under 29A.56. Because the same situation is in play this year, the Washington State Secretary of State's office is applying the same process to facilitate ballot access. Now, if you look at the letter of the law in Washington, I didn't see anything allowing specifically for provisional certification, much like Ohio law. But as Terry said here, if no one's challenging it, it's a non-issue. Yeah. And we do have the comments from Ohio's Secretary of State and Attorney General Javio saying it's going to be done by the letter of the law, which I'm for it being done by the letter of the law. I'm also for the law making sense. Yeah, just go ahead and move it along. Speaking of, let's talk about the big dog here. We're talking about Governor Mike DeWine. What would he say about this? Well, he just was quoted yesterday. And here's what he had to say. He said, we've got some technicalities that are going on. It's true. But it's going to get worked out, <clears throat> and so no one should really have any concern. They're going to have a choice this November. They're going to be able to pick one of these two to be our president. Sounds like a pretty solid affirmation for me that we are going to have our opportunity to vote for either a Democrat or a Republican. Yeah, it is. But can I just speak as an Ohio voter right now Please. and say, who's going to do it? Why do we have all of this mushy talk about it? You know, the DNC could do something. The Ohio legislature could do something. If they don't do something, there could be a lawsuit. The conversation has been that if there is a lawsuit, it will probably say that Ohio has to put Biden on the ballot. Just fix it. Just fix right? the law. Yeah, I know. It does seem very simple. And actually, from what I understand, uh, there has been some bipartisan talk about this, but actually fixing this problem once and for all it's just obviously there are political aspects to this right now that uh, are stopping common sense from happening. Yeah. Well, this whole they've got months to figure it out thing. Come on, guys. Let's figure it out. Yeah. Hey, we're figuring it out as we <laughs> march towards November on Ohio Has Issues. Thanks for being with us. Uh, we'll see you back here next week. Have a good week, everybody. Good night.